Greetings folks, in Jesus' name, Jeff Arnold coming to you again from Arnie's Garage. Thank you for tuning in. I hope I can be a blessing to you today. You sure have been a blessing to me. Kind remarks and prayers for my wife. Thank you so much. I'm reading and you're hearing today from the book of Psalms, chapter 8 and verse uh, 3. When I consider thy heavens... The work of thy fingers, the moon, the stars, which thou hast ordained. What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, crowned them with glory and honor, made him have dominion over the work of thy hands, thou hast put all things under his feet. I, I want to direct your attention to this because this is, this is so mind-boggling to me. And uh, I don't have anything here. Okay. I want to talk to you on the subject, what is man? What is man? Lord, bless the teaching. Help it to be a blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. In this scripture, when I read in the study of the Hebrew, what is man? The word for man is enosh, E-N-O-S-H. And it literally is describing man after his fall and it says that man is sick he's weak he's wretched he's mortal so that that is really what he was like after his fall but i i want to show you this scripture because this has always been mind-boggling to me he said but thou hast made him a little lower than the angels but in the original translation it says thou hast made him a little lower than elohim so if I understand this correctly, God made man as close to himself as he could without making another God. Woo! Hallelujah! Hallelujah! And I, I think that's really important. A little lower than God himself, made in the image and the likeness of God. And this is what I want you to get. There's no other creature that I can find recorded in the Bible angels, seraphims, cherubims, any other creature who was ever given that some way, somehow, that uh, declaration that he was made in the image and the likeness of God. There, there just isn't anything. There isn't anything like him. And yet, he turns around and, what is man that, that somehow thou should visit him and that thou somehow would talk to him and think about him and, and I want you to get how amazing the creation of mankind was and is, okay? Because fresh from the Creator's hands, mankind comes out and is given dominion and authority and headship over all of God's works. Now, now I, I want to just go over slow because I'm going to be kind of teaching a Bible study here. The Scripture says, He was made in the image and likeness of God. Now that is mind-boggling. He is the image and the glory of God, object of divine favor, divine desire, divine design, divine love. Image. I looked up in the dictionary. Image. A shadow or an outline, a resemblance, a profile, but not an exact representation as far as the substance, but simply a shadow. So, if you can understand that, when God made Adam, he made him in his image, in his likeness, but he was merely a shadow. He was an outline. He was a representation or a profile. A shadow will tell you and I certain things about the object that's projecting the shadow, but it will not define the object. It will not explain the object. It can be a profile. So we see the outline of the image. And so when, when God created Adam, he made him in his image after his likeness. Okay? So, but you got to understand something. That, that man, his dignity flows from the fact that he is like God, suggesting certain 
are divine ideas and ideals, but never explaining the full substance of what God is and was. So he was infinitely less in essence, and yet his substance was the substance of God, but it was in a shadow. So we don't get the full understanding of what it means. The shadow just indicates a truth about the object. So man is a revelation in some aspect of the truth of God and an image of his being, but he is much less than God himself. And so you got to understand something, that when God made Adam, he made him in his likeness, he made him after his image, okay? And there's an interesting scripture in the book of Romans chapter 5, where it says, Adam was made in the image, in the image of him that was to come. So one is the type and one is the prototype. So Jesus Christ was the example and the pattern for which Adam would be made. Remember, he's made after the image of him that was to come. Jesus was to come. So Adam was literally made in the image of Jesus Christ. I used to say for years, I think Adam and Jesus were like twins. They, 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 one was made after the image of the other. And so when you look at this, this is so powerful because mankind was made divinely by the creation power of Almighty God. He, if I can say this as kindly as I can, that, that Adam was God's stuff, the potter's clay, deity's dust, creator's child, woo, divine offspring, the potentate's purpose, wow, the maker's mirror, hallelujah. He was both a reflection and a revelation of God. But there was a great big difference because Adam could not in himself explain the magnitude and majesty of God as Jesus did when he came in. He said, I and my Father are one. And then he said, he that has seen me has seen the Father because he's the last Adam. He's the second Adam. Okay? And so he was a full demonstration and manifestation of the invisible God. He was the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So when Jesus talked to people, he said, look, if you see me, you see exactly what God is like. If you hear me talking, that is exactly the Word of God. If you see me acting, I'm acting just like God would because I am God incarnate. I am the Word made flesh. Remember, in the beginning was the Word, the Logos, the plan, the idea, the scheme, the idea. And the Word was with God, not alongside God. It was with God. It was His. It was Him. It was His idea, His plan, His, 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 his way of doing things. And the Word was made flesh, John 1, 14. And we beheld His glory, that of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So when Jesus came, if you can accept this, Jesus was two things. He was the Word, Logos, thought, idea, and plan, scheme, made flesh, watch. And He was the will of God expressed. But you got to get that because when you watch Jesus walk around, healing people, forgiving people, delivering people, showing people what God is like. He is actually expressing the divine nature of God, the divine will of God, the divine pleasure of God. That's why in, when you read Acts, I think 1038 said, how God anointed Jesus with the Holy Ghost and power who went about healing all that were oppressed of the devil, comma, for God was with him. So that's why when Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. To me, one of the greatest and most wonderful, merciful things that God ever did for us in the Incarnation was to correct the misconcept and incorrect ideologies and theories and theologies of what God was like. And when you don't have a proper perspective of what God is like, you end up with false conceptions. You end up with with misunderstandings. You end up with theories and ideologies that really pervert 
the great truth and knowledge of God. So when God incarnated himself to wit, God was in Christ reconciling the world. When he incarnated himself in the flesh and body of the man Jesus, he said, I'm come here to correct your misunderstandings. I'm come here to show you what I'm really like. Because what happens is when people do not have a full, correct understanding of what God is like and what He loves and what He wants, what He desires, we all come up with mis misunderstandings and we come up with misconceptions and that's what gives birth to wrong theologies, what gives birth to all kinds of religions, what gives birth to all kinds of philosophies. So that the world gets filled with all kinds of stuff while people are trying to understand and interpret what God is like. And I thank God that when when the incarnation took place, it's like God just ripped the veil back and said, look, I need to correct your understanding. I and the Father are one. What you hear from me is the Father. What you see the Father, what you see me doing is the Father doing. What I'm going to accomplish for you at Calvary is the love of God demonstrating His love for lost humanity. So I, I want you to understand something. I'm not, I'm not trying to deify mankind, but I, but I want to just show you that when it says, What is man that thou art mindful of him? I looked at my notes here and it says, Man was, was literally the divine offspring. He was a creation of God Himself. And when I read these scriptures, I cannot find any other creature anywhere that was ever referred to that somehow was made in the image and the likeness of God. There, I can't find anything like that. There is no other creature that was made that, that could ever say, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. There wasn't any. Angels couldn't say it. Seraphims, cherubims couldn't see it. Mankind could. But when, but when Jesus stepped in on the planet, he turned around and gave us the purest revelation of the thoughts of God in flesh. Okay? Now you got to get this. Man, in the beginning, was God's will manifested, a deliberate creation. Mankind was not and has never been a cosmic accident or a mistake or a thing listen carefully and he's not the result of evolution the purpose of evolution is real easy do away with mankind's guilt do away with man's responsibility for God do away with anything that he's going to be held accountable for if he's just a creature of mud and a tadpole and fish and evolution. He's a God unto himself. He don't have to answer for any of his actions. He's, he's just a glorified ape. That is insulting. God didn't do that. He made man exactly how he wanted man to be. He was made in his image. Now watch this. Because man was made from the earth, he was not made from dirt, he was made from dust. That's as near nothing as you can get. Okay, you got dust and you got dirt, that's it. But God took the dust of the earth, when you read Genesis 2, and breathed into man the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So from the creation, man became and was a duality. A duality, watch. The earth became his mother, the material realm, the spirit realm was his father. The spirit of the living God gave him life. So he was literally the spirit of God living in a human body. If you can accept this, I hope I don't want to cause you a bunch of craziness or trouble, but you have to understand something, that, that mankind was a combination of dust and deity of material and immaterial, of visible and invisible. You gotta watch this. Mankind is is also, according to 1 Thessalonians 5.23, he is tripart. He is body, soul, and spirit. That's what Paul says, I pray that your body, soul, and spirit be found blameless at the coming of the Lord. So he's body, soul, and spirit. So if you can understand this, his body makes him world conscious. And his body was given 
five laboratory assistants by God, which we call his five senses, touch and taste and see, smell and hear. He's got five laboratory systems that help him make contact with the world around him. But he also his soul, which is emotion, will, and intellect. And his soul makes him self-conscious. Now try it again. His body makes him world conscious. His soul makes him self-conscious. Watch this. And his spirit makes him God conscious. Woo! Hallelujah! Hallelujah! And so Adam was a spiritual being. He was a living soul and he was a, he was a living body. So he was, he was tripart. When mankind failed and got deceived and made the wrong decisions and sinned, he lost that aspect of his spirit being. So he no longer was communicating with God in the spirit realm. He was dealing with God now in the soulish realm, fear, anxiety, trepidation, worry, and flesh, hiding in the bushes. I hope, I'm, I, hope I haven't lost you yet. You got, you got to get this. Mankind is significant. I wrote this thing. He says, what is man that thou art mindful of him, the son of man that visits? So the psalmist seems that by comparing man with the, the heavenlies and the creative universe, he feels like man is insignificant, having little worth or meaning, having small importance to be trivial, to be unimportant, to be low in character or position. But God's view of mankind is different. He looks at us as somehow too valuable to be lost, to have, have a too much worth to be written off. And so when I looked up in the dictionary here for this other word about uh, significant, let me see, I wrote it down here, significant, where is it? Having value, here we go, very important, having great value, having meaning, importance, momentous. So when man compares himself to the universe, he feels insignificant, small, as nothing. But when you compare yourself to God and His divine will and His creation of us, it gives us an unbelievable significance because mankind now becomes the war zone between two powers. God Almighty wants mankind to be saved and restored. The evil one, Satan, the rebel, the devil, wants to destroy man and wants to take him to a devil's hell. So we become the focal point of a spiritual battle. And when we look at this, it, it's so mind-boggling to me that, that when God made man, apparently man becomes the only link, the only link between earth and heaven, the only link between the spirit world. Hallelujah. When you, when you look at Luke 22, which I've talked to you before, Simon, Simon, Satan has died to have you, that he might sift you as wheat, but I pray for you that your faith, don't, your faith doesn't fail. So it tells me right there, two worlds want mankind. Two worlds want mankind. Because there's more to mankind than his flesh. He's soul and spirit. And, and we have the right and the ability to deal with the spirit world. We have the right to be led by the gift of the Holy Ghost. The Spirit of God comes into our lives to help us. So I hope I'm, hope I'm, I'm making sense. I, I don't want to confuse you, but this is so mind-boggling to me about when that wonderful psalmist says, What is man? This, this blows my mind, that thou art mindful of him. you got to hear me. Mankind... Mankind was heaven's earth worshiper. He was the only worshiper that man, that God gave on planet earth. He had worshipers in heaven, the angels, the seraphims, the cherubims. But when he made mankind, he made mankind with the ability to some way, somehow, be a worshiper of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And to bring God pleasure. He literally, as I've said before, became the custodian of God's joy. He was also designed by God to be able to give birth to eternal 
offspring. He was related to the Father of Spirits. He had relationship with God, which gave him rulership on the planet and also authority and rulership over devils and demons. But, but when he sinned, he somehow, somehow, he lost that authority because God then lost his earth worshiper. So he now lost relationship, which then makes you lose rulership. That's the wonderful blessing of the new birth. By being born again of the water and the spirit, we now become restored to our relationship with the God of glory, the Father of spirits, the Creator, the Magistrate, the High and Holy Potentate, the Sovereign Lord of glory, the Great I Am. We now become related to Him, and in so doing, as we live and move and operate in the Spirit, there is given to us a right of rulership. And you see that when Jesus Christ came on this planet and began to walk among us, He had authority and power over devils, over demons, over diseases, over nature, over animals, over fish, over the fowl of the air, because He was in right relationship with the spirit world, it gave Him divine authority to have rulership over everything He dealt with. Even death, He could speak to death, and death had to give up what it held three different times. He had three different resurrections. And so when you look at this, this is so amazing to me that mankind is more than just a bundle of cells, more than just some guy or lady that walks around and, and acts funny or dresses funny. That's crazy. You, 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 you got to stay with me just for a minute because I, I, I'm a really on this thing. This, you got to get this. When you read Psalms 90, verses 1 and 2 in 1 Peter 2.25, we find out that according to the Scriptures, mankind was God's before the universe was ever created. He was our dwelling place before this stuff was ever brought up. And what happened is, if you can accept this, mankind became lost to God in time. How? He transgressed. He rebelled. He took of the fruit that he wasn't supposed to take. And when he did, he turned around and spiritually he died. You can be aware and not be alive spiritually. Because when, when the Lord came talking in the Garden of Eden, he heard his voice and he was afraid of him because he had spiritually disconnected from God. Now he was still dealing with God on the flesh level and on the soulless level, but not on the spiritual level. Because the Lord had said, in the day that you eat the fruit, you shall surely die. Now his flesh didn't die for 900 years. So now, was God lying? No! He was giving us a revelation. He died or became disconnected from the authority and the life flow of the spirit realm. So now he was away from God and he, he was dead spiritually. So now when you look at this, he some way, somehow was not walking with God anymore. That's why he told the angels, he said, get a, a cherubim in front of the tree of life, lest man take a hold of that and live forever in his condemned state. So the Lord put that cherubim in front of him, swinging the sword. So this fallen man could not be able to get a hold of that lest he lived in that doomed position for the rest of his life. Now, if you can accept this, mankind because of sin, became what I call a ruined instrument. And if he's going to be fixed, he's going to have to be fixed by something or someone outside of him, a person or a power who can approach him and then operate on him and in him to be able some way to redeem him and restore him and recover him and reconcile him. And I, I'm trying to show you how valuable in the sight of God, how precious in the sight of God is even the worst fallen man, the worst sinner, the lowest sinner there is. That doesn't bother God. 
because God loves us and cares about us. And I, I, I want to I wanna ask you a question. Why would God want to fix and restore and redeem man when God has got the power, he can make a complete another race. He can make another one. Why would he want to go through all the pain and the process of redeeming and restoring mankind? The only answer we have comes from God himself. His nature is love. And because he loves us, he's willing to pay whatever price he can to get us back. Oh, hallelujah. And that is the reason for redemption. To wit, God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, but having taken our trespasses out of the way and nailed it to the cross of Jesus Christ. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. So the answer for redemption flows from God's holy heart. He loves man in spite of the fact. And even though mankind has failed God, listen carefully, and, and man is not owed anything by God. He has forfeited any claim to God. But the reconciliation comes from the God who is rich in mercy, who is full of grace, who loves mankind in spite of it. He loves you and he loves me. And mankind in his ruined state, however he cried out, however he prayed, whatever he said or thought, he somehow sent a cry out to the heavens, help, help, please come to my rescue. Almost like when Israel cried out in Exodus 3, 7, and 8, when they were in bondage and slavery and they were hopeless and helpless and they couldn't get out. And God came down and talked to Moses and said, I have seen the affliction of my people and I know their sorrows and I've heard their cry and I've come down to rescue them and redeem them and bring them out of their bondage and bring them into a place called the promised land. Oh, hallelujah. That's what makes this so wonderful. When you look at this and say, what is man? This is so mind boggling to me. What is man that somehow, some way, you think about him, that you you just have thoughts about mankind. Hallelujah. I, I was looking over here in my notes before and it says, God, God Almighty, who is who is majestic and almighty and all powerful, who is all wise and all knowing, who created all things and set up the galaxies and the planets and the earth seasons, who regulates the animal kingdom. Who somehow, some ways, whose path, whose ways are past finding out that there's nobody like him, that he is life and light and truth and eternal. He is absolutely unchanged. He dwells in the light that no man can approach. And yet, some way, somehow, he thinks about me. Hallelujah. I, I, I hope you understand what I'm saying. What is man that thou art mindful of him? To think that this God that is almighty, all-powerful, all-wise, all-knowing, sovereign Lord of everything, yet he thinks about you. And he thinks about me. Do you realize Joe Biden doesn't think about you except to rape you for taxes? Do you understand that the government doesn't think about you except to molest you for taxes? Do you understand that your mayors and your governors don't give you one thought personally? That, that the leaders of this city, they don't think about me. But today, before I got out of bed, God was thinking about me. Woo! And God is thinking about you. I, I, I pray that I could get this on your mind right now. That God's mind is on me. What is man? that you think about him, that you're concerned about him, that you care about him, that you have plans for him, that you have a purpose for him, that you've got something you want to do. You know, I read a wonderful story many, many years ago on a thing, and Albert Einstein, who was the great brain, said, I want to know the thoughts of God, for everything else in life is purely incidental.
Wow. Well, I got news for you. Today, Almighty God has got me and thee on his mind. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. And, and you got to understand that when mankind was made, mankind was actually God's thought, God's will, and God's ideas manifested. Hallelujah. But you got to get this. This is so powerful. This is so awesome. What is man that, that you actually think about him, that you want him to somehow win at life? You want him to somehow just undertake and do something here. I, I, I've got so many notes sitting here. It's mind-boggling. I, I, I wrote a little note here, and I hope you can accept this. Satan, who was a rebel, who was an original worshiper, got thrown out for non-performance. Satan, therefore, hated God with a resentment and a passion. But he knew he could not attack God on a frontal attack because God just threw him out like that. Boom! 186,000 miles per second, the speed of light, pow, threw him out. But he wanted some way to be able to hurt God, but he couldn't attack him personally. So what does he do? He turns around and finds a way that he can hurt God. Why? He looked at mankind who was in the place of probation in the garden with limited liberty, and he knew that God hated sin but he knew that God loved mankind. God hated insurrection. He hated willful disobedience. So what does he do? He tricked Eve and he tricked mankind into disobeying God. And they choose wrong. And now they're going to force God's hand. Because now with mankind committing sin in the garden, now if I can say this kindly, we have divinity in a dilemma. God looked at man that he loved and he now saw what he hated. Sin. Woo! Oh my goodness. Almost like in a minor way how sometimes we parents see stuff in our children that we are disappointed with or angry with or almost borderline hated, but we love the child and yet we promise to punish but we do not want to somehow pulverize the child and kill the child for their mistake, although we do want to correct them. Well, God's looking at us, and here he is saying, I'm looking at what I love, and I'm seeing what I hate. So what does he do? If he lets man go, then God becomes a liar, because he has said, in the day you eat the fruit, you shall surely die. So we got divinity in a dilemma. So what is he going to do? He's got to do something. He wants to punish sin, but he wants to pardon Adam, the sinner. So he's in a, he's in a dilemma. What is he going to do? He cannot break his word because the whole universe is held in stock because of the greatness of his word. So here's what he does. He turns around and he finds an innocent animal. And the Bible, if you read it, Genesis 2, Genesis 3, he slays an innocent animal, sheds the blood, because Leviticus 17, 11 says the life is in the blood and, and, and the blood makes atonement for us on the altar. He sheds the innocent blood of an animal and covers Adam and Eve in the coats which is an act of grace, and grants them the righteousness of an animal, although they are guilty. So they are covered with the warm skins of this animal, and the blood makes atonement. Now, it does not in any way make God satisfied. It just pacified His present wealth until the time comes when He's going to incarnate Himself in the body of the Lord Jesus Christ and he's going to become the Lamb of God that doesn't have any sin who is slain from the foundation of the world that was already in the mind of God before Adam and Eve ever dropped the ball so you gotta get me you gotta see how fantastic a place mankind and you ladies also has in the mindset of God 
that God would literally move heaven and earth to somehow redeem and restore and pardon his guilty child. Woo! Hallelujah! You know, all these multiplied millions and millions of angels, tens of thousands, times ten thousands and thousands, yet one third of them fail God and I can't find anywhere where God ever tried to restore and reconcile one fallen angel. But look what he did for one fallen couple. Oh, hallelujah. Think what he's done for you and for I. Hallelujah. Or I should say me. Just think what he's done. And I want you to grab a hold of the magnitude in the mind of God of mankind. I know what David said when I consider the heavens. I'm not comparing you or me to the heavens. I am looking at the heartbeat of God and the will of God and the purpose of God. When I look at God, I realize that you and I have a special place in the heart, mind, and purpose, spirit of Almighty God. And this whole thing is about our restoration and our reconciliation. Hallelujah. When Jesus walked among us, He showed us the goodness of God. He showed us just some ways how much God loved us. Remember, Adam and Eve failed with the temptation of the devil in the garden. But the same devil tempted Jesus in the wilderness, but he overcame them temptations by it is written, it is written, it is written. And it gave him power and authority over every devil and every demon and every spirit and every disease and every sinner. Oh, hallelujah to God. So man, hallelujah, as I said, was a ruined instrument. It's almost like somebody finding a watch on the beach and they look at the watch. What is the face? The face is lying. The watch is broken on the inside. And the face is telling the wrong time. So somebody's got to go inside the watch and fix the mechanism so the face tells the truth. Woo! That's what God has done for us. He has reached inside of us and fixed the wrong mechanism. How? He gave us His divine nature. We are partakers of the divine nature. He has restored that lost nature to mankind so that we are now in a God class with Him. Oh, hallelujah. We're not gods. We're just in the God class. We are now partakers of the divine nature. And the Spirit of the living God now lives in us. So now we become His house, His body, His temple his ambassadors, his worshipers, his workers, his upcoming bride. Woo! Hallelujah! We now become the treasure of the planet because according to the rapture, he's coming back for the redeemed. He's coming back for the reconciled. There's one more thing that needs to be done. Remember? Body, soul, spirit. Body, soul, spirit. The soul is dealt with with the blood of Calvary. The Spirit is dealt with with the reception of the baptism of the Holy Ghost at Pentecost. The only thing that still needs fixing is the body. Woo! Are you ready? In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the sound of the last trump, and the trump's going to sound, and Jesus Christ is going to descend from heaven, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive shall remain. We shall uh, be caught up together with them in the clouds and the air, so shall we ever be with the Lord. And John says in 1 John 3 that we shall have a glorious body like unto his glorious body. So at the rapture, there's going to be a transformation of our human body and going to experience a resurrected glorious body that will never get sick and will never die. Don't you get it? Don't you get it? What a high degree mankind has in the heart and mind of God that God would do all this. And, and the other thing I want to say to you, there's one other part here, I'm almost out of time, that thou visitest him. Wow. I've never had President Biden visit me. I haven't had the mayor of this city visit me. I haven't had the city councilman visit me. I haven't had DeSantis visit me. I haven't had anybody that's in leadership visit me. I haven't had any movie stars visit me. When Elvis was alive, he didn't visit me. Guess what? 
every day of my life and your life, we're privileged to experience a visit from the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He either talks to us, He impresses us with thoughts, He creates pictures in our mind, we feel an urge, a surge of His presence. When we worship God in spirit and in truth, He visits us. Oh man, hallelujah. I thank God. What is man? Man is God's special prize. Man is His highest creation on planet Earth, higher than any other animal species. And mankind is what Jesus Christ came to die in our place and restore us and reconcile us back to God. Oh, hallelujah. My Lord. And the Bible said, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now watch that. How precious in the sight of God mankind is in our terrible debauchery, in our self-righteousness, in our sinfulness, in our immorality, in our dishonesty, in our foolishness, in our ungodliness. Jesus Christ looked at us and said, I love you in spite of that and I'm going to carry all your mistakes and all your sins and I'm going to take them into my body and I'm going to go to Calvary and I'm going to shed my sin remitting blood, my innocent precious blood. Remember I've told you Acts 20:28, 20, take heed unto the, the flock, the church which God purchased with his own blood. So the blood of Jesus Christ is the blood of Almighty God. And God shed His blood so that He could buy us back. So we have been purchased. I told you this before. The blood purchases and the Spirit possesses. Woo! Hallelujah! The blood makes atonement and the Spirit is the Spirit of adoption. And that's what mankind... What is mankind? Mankind is God's special treasure, His special prize. Oh, hallelujah. I thank God today that the Bible said that He is mindful of us. He's mindful of us when we fail. He's mindful of, of us when we're afraid. He's mindful of us when we make wrong decisions. He's mindful of us when we have a bad attitude. He's mindful of us when we're picking low cotton. He's mindful of us when people have hurt us. He's mindful of us when we've hurt other people. He's mindful of, of us when we're having to deal with temptations and trials and tests and, and lusts of the flesh and the mind and the spirit. He's mindful of us. And I, and I thank God, hear me, mankind, I will never leave you, Jesus said. And I will never forsake you. And then Paul writes and says, And he'll never put on us more than we're able to bear. And with every test and every trial, he will make a way of escape. Oh, hallelujah. I pray in Jesus' name today that you might somehow, some way, if I, if I can say this in the right way, that you could see man or see yourself from God's perspective. Hallelujah. That you could see yourself how God thinks about us. Hallelujah. That, that we, are, we are more than conquerors in the heart and mind of God. Hallelujah. 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 I thank God. Job said that, uh, well, let me, I'm going to read Job 10 and 12 just for just a second. I'm almost done. I want to read this Job 10 and 12. Watch this. This is so powerful. Come on, Jeffrey. Get over here. Job 10 and 12. Where's, where's my scripture? 10 and 12. Where are we? Here we go. Watch this. For thou hast granted me life and favor. Here we go. And thy visitation hath preserved my spirit. Then I think it's over here in, in 30, 33, 34. Here it is. 33 and verse 4. The Spirit of God has made me. I'm not a cosmic accident. I'm not a frog. I'm not, a, I'm not a, a, a leech coming up on the dirt somewhere. The Spirit of God hath made me, and the breath of Almighty has given me life. Oh, hallelujah. I pray 
in Jesus' name, that these little thoughts I brought out to you today would be a blessing to you, and you would realize how special that you are, irregardless of your shortcomings, your failures, your mistakes, your fears, your anxieties. Oh, Lord, somehow open our understanding that we may realize that we are special in the sight of God, that you created us in the beginning, and you're working with us through time. And even though you lost mankind in time through the incarnation, you stepped into time to rescue us, to save us from sin and from self and from Satan and somehow adopt us and atone for us and bring us back to yourself. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Please bless your people today and open their understanding. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. See you next time.